So for our pulse extraction tower, uh, the capacity is 20 to 30 cubic meter per, per square meter per hour. So this is best suited for nuclear applications due to lack of seal. So meaning there's no sealing. There are no seals that needs to be regularly uh, replaced in the case of the other towers. So this one is best suited for nuclear applications. By the way, with the specific towers that will be discussed in this separation process, you have to focus on their special application. What makes a particular tower special or unique compared to the others? And that's how we uh, study and make things easily recalled. Okay, now this is also best suited for corrosive applications when constructed out of non-metal. So it could be constructed purely of materials that are non-metal. So also applicable to corrosive application. So limited stages, so meaning we cannot have uh, so many stages here due to back mixing. Okay, and limited diameter and height due to pulse energy required. So there's an energy requirement, another uh, added energy requirement here since our column needs to be pulsed as it is being operated. Now for pulse packed and sieve tray towers, now they are actually uh, mechanically agitated. So mechanically agitation, mechanical agitation is used so that the, uh, shall we say, the thing that is processed inside the equipment is ensured to be uniform in consistency or throughout the process. The main purpose also is to increase mass transfer efficiency, which has something to do to throughput. The throughput has something to do with the amount recovered for the component of interest uh, based on the amount that was processed, that's throughput. So if we have mechanical or some form of agitation in our columns or extraction tower, that will increase the mass transfer efficiency. Now for pulse pack towers, uh, HETS, it's being reduced, uh, shall I say, it reduces the HETS by a factor of two or so. Meaning if you have your uh, shall I, standard, your standard uh, pulse pack tower, or rather if you have a standard pack tower only that is not pulsed. Now, if you're going to up, uh, apply pulsation or some form of agitation in the column, the HETS is reduced by a factor of two or so. The HETS is the height equivalent to a theoretical stage. So it is reduced by a factor of two or even uh, more than that if the tower, the original pack tower, is pulsed. Now for liquids with high interfacial tension, now higher than 25, so you can see that the range here is 30 to 40 dime per centimeter, a pulse pack tower is suggested. So not just an ordinary pack tower this time, but the tower has to be pulsed. Now, what about pulsed sieve tray towers? So the whole size for this particular tower is 0.32 centimeter. The free, the total free space is 20 to 25% of the entire space of the tray. And the tray spacing, the space of the tray on top of another or below it should be 5.1 centimeter. Now, tray occupies the entire cross section of the tower and there are no downspouts. Uh, if you notice in the previous towers that uh, we, I have shown to you, there is some form of guide for the student, for the liquids that are flowing down your column for it to flow as directed. That is referred to as the downspout. In the case of the past sieve tray towers, there is no need or there is no downspout. So there's no need for the downspout. So the entire cross section of the tower is your tray itself or the trays themselves. Now we also have what we call, so aside from pulse tower, pulse pack tower or pulse sieve tray tower, we also have what we call as the mechanically agitated extraction tower. So since it is agitated, so there is some form of a steerer inside the uh, column. So in this case, you can see that this one continually moves. 
So this one, the one that you, uh, shown here in this slide is the Shibil Tower, or, or how do you pronounce it, Shibil Tower. Now this uses rotating turbine agitators with outer settling zones. So operates on a series of mixer settler extraction units. So inside your column, it's as if your first stage or your stages, that is, your end stage for that matter, or end stage for that matter, is uh, likened to a mixer settler extraction unit. And then they are now arranged in series, one on top of another. So this one has a reasonable capacity, but not as bigger as the pulse uh, tower because we have a bigger capacity for the pulse tower. This one is only 15 to 25 cubic meter per square meter per hour. This has high efficiency due to internal buffling. So in terms of efficiency, this is more efficient and a good turn down capability. Now best suited, so this is the application when many stages are required. So if the pulse pack tower or the pulse sieve tray towers limits the number of stages to be used, this one can have many stages. Now, not recommended though for highly fouling systems or systems that tend to emulsify. Now, each of the towers have a particular special advantage over another and has a particular special use. Now, this one has a limitation in the sense that uh, capacity is not as large compared to the pulse pack tower and cannot process systems that will tend to emulsify or will be easily fouled up once processed inside the column. So this is for our Sheville Tower. Now we have another mechanical agitated tower or mechanically agitated extraction tower, which is the CAR, reciprocating plate tower. So the tower is not pulsed to induce agitation. It does not have any agitator inside, but this time it's the place that uh, moves so you have reciprocating plate tower so in here the tray holes would be expected or is uh, uh, having the size of 1.4 centimeter now this has a bigger of open space compared to the Shibble tower which is only 25 percent of the total tray space which is open this one can have up to 50 to 60 percent in, term of, in terms of plate spacing, one on top of another, this, is, this one can also have the plate space, uh, the plate spacing can be increased. So in the previous one, I think it's only around five, but this one can have as much as 15. The highest capacity of all uh, extraction tower, mechanically agitated towers, 30 to 60 cubic meter per square meter per hour. Good efficiency, good turn down capability, uniform shear mixing, best suited for systems that emulsify. So if you have a problem with the Shebel tower because your system will emulsify, this one is the tower for you to use or suggest or design that is. Okay, so our car reciprocating tower, they are also found in your books. You can read more on this, on the things that are written here in the slides. Now we go to continuous multi-stage countercurrent extraction. The towers that were previously discussed are all operating in multi-stage fashion, meaning not just one extraction, but several extraction systems arranged adjacent each other or one top of another. So if we will have the schematic diagram of a continuous multi-stage countercurrent extraction system uh, presented, this would be something like this. If you want this illustrated vertically, all you have to do is move this clockwise. Like you turn this clockwise and that's it. It's already a column. This one is a side-by-side -side representation of a multi-stage countercurrent extraction. Feed is LO, extract is V1, solvent is V sub N plus one, and roughenet is LN. If we recall in our discussion regarding a single stage extraction, we ended here. So our feed is LO, our solvent is V2, our extract is V1, and our raffinate is L1. That is in the case of single extraction. 
but when we have several already, so we will just change the subscripts of the solvent and the raffinate in this case. Okay, just like the way we do with uh, gas absorption and stripping. Now, when we do overall material balance, we simply account for the phases that enter our system and the phases that leave, the sum of which equated to the bulk phase M. Now, if we make a balance on C, which is most of the time the solvent, or it is suggested that you make a component balance on the solute, which is A, the L will be multiplied by X, the Vs will be multiplied by Y your M will be multiplied by X, okay? That's how we do component balance. Now, it's suggested also that you should only have this two. If you, you add one more material balance, let's say on a particular component, it will not be of use anymore. It's because we only need one component balance and one overall material balance for any uh, separation process for that matter. Now, this one is the representation, the graphical representation of how you go about determining the theoretical number of stages in our textbook. But this particular illustration does not yet present how the delta is located. So I will just simply uh, draw here, uh, annotate here that way I can uh, re represent the location of the delta. But nonetheless, the feed is LO. This is your feed. This is your solvent, the V sub N plus 1. Your V1 is your extract. And your LN is your raffinate. Okay? Now, if you use graphical approach, of course, we will not use graphical approach during the board exam. You will use analytical approach. And that will be the pro the thing that I will use in a little while in determining the number of stages you would still need how or you would still need in my opinion to understand how this particular triangular diagram is being used in determining the theoretical number of stages now most of the time the problem gives you the composition of the feed and the solvent okay and either one of these two is given so it could be that the raffinate is given V1 is not, or it could be V1 that is not given and the uh, raffinate is to be determined. Let's say, for example, that you are given. Uh, you're given this figure. Okay. You're given LO. You're given the solvent. And let's say you're given the raffinate. So what you do first is you plot this LO and your V sub N plus 1. Most of the time in the problem, the solvent is 100% pure. So it's right on the tip or in the point C here in our triangle. Okay. The LO that you have placed in here, you connect with this point in here. And you will have a straight line out of that. Then... If the raffinate is given, you use the concentration of the solute or it could be of the solvent that is given in the problem. But if both is given in the raffinate, you use the composition of the solute and that is the A. Using that A, you draw, you draw your raffinate right on the lower part of this face envelope. So it has to be drawn in here where my cursor is. So you have to draw your raffinate here. Okay. The next thing that you will do is, of course, you need to find this particular point M. Okay? You need to find point M. How do you find point M? So M is determined using material balance, which will be illustrated to you in a little while. But nonetheless, uh, if you want to know how you're going to find M, uh, not in, let's say, in the specific application to a problem, you can use a component balance equation. Let's say using A, MXAM is equal to LOXAO plus B sub N plus 1 times Y sub A N plus 1. Okay, you use this. If you have this four information, 
and you know the value of the M, how do you get the value of the M? It's a simple case of overall material balance. So you have LO plus V sub N plus one, or it could be uh, LN and V1 if it's given. So either which of the two. So you have this, you substitute in here, you will of course get next will be the XAM. Most of the time this is known, this is known, and of course this is known because it's just the sum of these two. So you get to know the XAM. How will you find the location of the M right on this line connecting L, O, and C? Very simple. What you're going to do is with the XAM that you got, you see this H, uh, X sub AM rather here, you locate that particular value on the horizontal axis and you go up, project it on the line connecting L, O, and C. Or rather L, O, and V sub N plus 1 because your V sub N plus 1 is right on point C. That would be your M. If you did not use a component balance based on component A, it could be a material balance based on C. Okay, you have LOXCO plus V sub N plus 1, Y sub C N plus 1. And still, either of these two equations will lead, lead you to either XAM or XCM. But let me emphasize this, you need not do both. You only need one. Why is that? So you could also see X sub CM here, right? So if, you're, if you were able to determine the X sub AM, so you project up until you reach the line and that's where your M is. And that's it. That's where your M is. Now, if you did not determine XAM, but you determined X sub CM, you use the vertical value here and project it rightwards and rest on the line again, connecting L sub O and C. That would also give you M. M is always on the line connecting L sub O and B sub N plus one. It's always right on that. Why is it? It's because M is the sum of these two, okay? Now, you have, remember, you already uh, located the L sub N, the raffinet on the lower face envelope here. So what you do, you connect this L sub N, the raffinet, on the lower part of your face envelope to the M that you have placed right on the line LO and V sub N plus one. Extend that, you make a straight line extending until you reach on the upper part of the, the face envelope. That will give you your V sub N plus one. This procedure is really the set procedure in properly locating the four points representing the phases of your extraction system. These four points are crucial when you determine the number of stages analytical, uh, graphically in this case. Okay, so you need these four points that way you can determine the number of stages graphically. I will pause for a while because I have an important message to answer class. Huh? Give me two minutes. Okay, so that's it. Now I will erase everything that I have marked in here. That way I can locate the delta, which is very important in determining the number of stages. So clear everything. Now you have located, so given, let's say for example, that you have located all the points, the pertinent points in determining the number of stages, you will, uh, what, uh, you will make, we'll make another, we'll make this thinner. We'll connect the points that we have here. Let's say this one and this. I, I can't, I'm not sure if I'm going to make one straight line. Let's say I'll connect this one okay, in this straight. And then you'll extend it upwards okay, like that. So take note, you have connected V1 and LO. The next thing that you will connect is the the next thing that you will connect is the LN and the V sub N plus one. So connect these two. Like that. And you will extend it as well. 
Why will you extend? Because you need to find the intersection of these two extended lines. The very important point that you have located in this case now is your delta point. And it is very important in determining the number of stages for your extraction system. Now, I will continue. I'll use a different color here. That way you will see. Remember that the equilibrated stages in ore separation processes are the, or rather not the equilibrated stages, the equilibrated phases in all separation processes, uh, uh, multi-stage that is, are the phases that are leaving a particular stage. So meaning if I'm going to look for a phase that is in equilibrium with V1, that would be the L1 phase. The one with B2 is the uh, L2 phase and so on and so forth. So if this is my first extract, it has to be equilibrated with L1, which is my raffinate, both uh, leaving stage one. So how do I find L1? So let's say, for example, okay, we'll make it black. You have here in the lower part, I'll make it very small, class, so that I can fit in everything. You have here your rectangular diagram, and you have your 45 degree line, for example, and you have your curve here, right? Now, make another color green, a sad green. What you do, you recall, if it's extract, the procedure is. Uh, you go, anybody who can remember, if it's extract, we go, where do we end? We re, do we end on the line or do we end on the port on the curve? Where do we end? Anyone? Do I have company here? If I will start, if I will start from the extract and I want to find the equilibrated phase raffinate for that particular extract, what's the procedure of finding the tie line or finding that particular phase in equilibrium with my extract? Isn't it? I go down from the extract until I reach the where will I end? Where I end in the 45 degree line, or will I end on the curve? Anybody? Where should I end? On the 45 degree line or on the curve? Hmm? None? You started with the extract. Eh? Nobody in the chat? Oh, thankful. 45 degree line. Thank you, Joe Byrne. 45 degree line. So you end in the 45 degree line, you turn. Of course, think be makadu, lang ma left ka wai ka ano. So you turn right and then you go up until. Oh, sa la akon flat. But like, like, let's say for example this one. Until you find this point here. Okay, I'll make this block. This point, this point here is L1, the equilibrated phase of V1. Now, this L1, take note how you will connect with the uh, delta point. So you make a line. No. Where is that L1? So you make a line connecting L1. Okay? Example, class, sakto ng pang-connect ko. Ari si L1. No? Ari siya. Palayo. Saan yung pondohan ni Miss? Ari si L1. Okay? This is L1. I've connected L1 to delta. The purpose of connecting L1 to delta is to find the next extract. The next extract block. 
So the point here on the upper face envelope where this line connecting delta and L1 is intersecting is your V2. Now, how do you find L2? The same thing. The same thing the way you did find L1. Go down. Turn right. Go up. Let's say, for example, it will be here. Sample lang class para hindi maginamo. Then you have. Then you have L2 now. This is L2. How do you find V3? The same thing. I'll find a yellow color here. You connect again delta to L2. Okay. It will pass through the upper face envelope. The point it will pass through the upper face envelope is your V3. This is your V3. Now, then the same procedure goes on. Now, how do you determine the number of stages? You have already located the Vs and you have located the Ls here using the principle of uh, making or looking for the tie line. Now, then how do you determine the number of stages? The number of stages would be, I will look for blue. The number of stages will be the number of lines that you will be making connecting V1, sorry, connecting, where is L1 here? V1 and L1, V2 and L2. Kung may V3 and L3, ka example, are this L3, V3 and L3. These blue lines, Connecting the phases that live a particular stage are your number of theoretical stages. When will you stop counting? When you rest right on LN or you go beyond LN? If you go beyond LN, then the number of theoretical stages would only be a fraction. So you make an approximation of the total length of distance. What's the remaining length here on the... Uh, face envelope that you went beyond. So in terms of length of the curve, uh, what is the percentage that uh, you have went beyond LN? So you subtract that from one, then your stage would only be like 0.7 or 0.6 or 0.8 because you went beyond by 0.1 based on the length of the curve here. That's how you determine the number of stages graphically, okay? There is one specific example in Jan Kuplis where this illustration that I just discussed is being uh, discussed. But nonetheless, it's everything that I have also covered. You need to know that that way, should there be a need for you to use both graphical and analytical way of determining the number of stages you know. But of course, you're not going to use that during the board exam. You need to know how to solve it. Um, shall I say, analytically. So recall ko lang. So if you have, for example, L1 here, kidoga ginamo, siya kaina. And you have here, let's say V2. And you have L2 here. L1. And you have V3. And you have L3 here. So the tie lines actually that you would be seeing in our books are the ones in broken line connecting the equilibrated phases. So you have your delta here. Okay, how do you find the delta? You connect the raffinet here to the delta. Or rather, how do you find the delta? You first connect the four points here. And once it's there, you connect the delta with the LNs here to get the extract, the Vs. To so the Ls, delta to the Ls to get the Vs. Okay. Once you have the V, you connect the next, you can determine the next L by using the uh, lower part of the rectangular diagram. That's how you determine the number of stages graphically. Okay, any questions so far? None? 
Okay, so then we will proceed with the next on the slide. Okay, sorry, I'm on the slide actually. Okay, so we have this particular problem talking about an aqueous feed of 200 kilogram per hour containing 25 weight percent acetic acid, which is being extracted using pure isopropyl ether at the rate of 600 kilograms per hour. You see uh, 600 kilograms per hour in a counter current multi-stage system. The exit acid concentration in the aqueous phase is to con contain three weight percent acetic acid. Calculate the compositions and amounts of the exit and raffinate stream. So this one is solved both uh, analytically and graphically. So not 100% graph uh, analytical, it will be relying on the diagram. So let's see, we'll go back to our board. Okay, we'll write down what we are given in the problem. Feel free to write on the chat box should you have any questions. So let's say you write down what we're provided in the problem. Your feed, so that would be LO is 200 kilograms per hour. It contains 25 weight percent acetic acid. So then if acetic acid is A, then it must be 0.25. And your solvent, B sub N plus one, is pure isopropyl ether. So this is 600 kilograms per hour and it's pure isopropyl ether. So your Y sub CN plus one is 1 1.0. Now you're given that the exit acid concentration in the aqueous phase. So when you speak of the aqueous phase, that's your raffinate phase. So the exit acid concentration referring to A in the raffinate, so that should be N is 3%, so that would be 0 0.03. These are the five specific quantities mentioned in the problem. You are required to calculate the composition and amounts. So amounts of the exit and raffinate layers. So I need the extra, I need the raffinate, and I need their composition. So in the extract, I want, of course, YA1, that's important. And the LN, I need the XA1 because we want to really uh, quantify where all the A's went. And that's the acetic acid in this case. So the acid, the solute that we are um, balancing the quantity of. So we have now the solution. Okay, if we will start with an overall material balance, that would be your LO plus V sub N plus 1, which could also be your V1 plus LN, and which is your bulk phase M. Your LO is 200, your V sub N plus 1 is 600, these two still unknown, and M. So 800 is equal to these two phases that we want to know and equal to the bulk phase. We'll make it as our equation one. If you do component balance and I want it on A, on A, then you will have it LO, XAO, plus V sub N plus one, Y sub A N plus one is equal to, we cannot deal with this two because N in the first place, they are all unknowns. So I will just make use of M, X, A, M. Now, if I will substitute the values given in the problem, we don't have any A in our solvent. It's pure C. So this is zero. 
So your feed is 200. You multiply it with the weight percent of acetic acid in the feed. You know already that the M is 800 from equation one, and you have X, A, M. Now from here, you'll be able to find the X, A, M. Can you please tell me the value of X, A, M? Fifty divided by eight hundred point zero six two five. Thank you. So you have point zero six two five. Okay, that's our point zero six two five. Now, I would like to ask a question based on what you have listened to a while ago. I already know the x a m. This is X A M, the very important X A M. Can you please tell me on what's the next thing that I will do that way I can find my way through the solution to finding composition and amounts of the exit and exit and extract layers or roughen it and extract layers. Anyone who can suggest what we're supposed to do? Okay. Solve for XCM. Okay. Uh, you can also solve for XC, uh, XCM, Emilio, but I have emphasized a while ago to save time. You can only solve one of them. Uh, you have the option to solve only one of them because you don't need the other one if you know already A. Like if you already know the C, there's no need for you to solve the A. Now we know already the A. Uh, I don't think we'd still, we will still need the C because we know already the A. So only one will do. It's just like when you use component balance, you only use component balance once. You don't use it twice. Okay? So what do you think would be the next step? Based on what we have discussed a while ago, what do you think is the next step? Suggestion? What do you need to do? Anyone? None? No idea. Who's in my room? Oh, I thank goodness I have one here. Connect to M, Mr. Graph. Katrina, what will I connect to M? Before you connect M to something, what is the first thing that you will do? Before you connect M to something, what would be the first thing that you will do? Plot X A M. Plot. What will I plot, Sarah? What will I plot? Ang L O miss kag ang nakwa ng V N plus one miss sa grab. O miss ang L N miss kag amon na sila tatlo miss. Ang tatlo sila. Ang L N ang Next, Sarah, ang LN, the soon ang? Ang LO, miss. Ang LN, ang LO, kag ang? Isa pa. Ang V. V. Ayaw kinalan, tapag, miss, ang extract, ang V1, miss. Amun. Hindi, hindi. Sakto na to, day. Ano to? Uh -huh. Ang LO, ang LN, ano pang isa? Ang Isang. M kag V1, miss. Ang VN plus 1. Okay, very good, very good. You will plot LO v sub n plus one and l n after you have plotted the three you use x a m so that we will do okay so we will plot very good sarah so go back to the slide because that's where our diagram is so i can show to you where you're going to do
Okay. This is our diagram, right? So we will plot, we will plot LO. So Sarah is correct. You will plot LO. LO, XAO, by the way, XAO is, where's my screenshot? XAO is 25%. So you will plot 25 here. This is 10, this is 20. So 25 and uh, what else is stated here? An aqueous feed of 200 kilograms containing 25 weight percent acetic acid is being extracted. So 0.25, your LO is 0.25. It's aqueous, so everything is water, no C. So meaning it's right on here. It's aqueous, so you have to be very observant on what is stated in the problem. Meaning no C for the feed. It's right on the horizontal axis. You only use the 25% acetic acid. So 0 0.10, 0 0.20, 0 0.25, it's here. This is a problem that you cannot solve purely analytically. So you have L, O. Now, Sarah is very correct when she said that you're going to plot B sub N plus 1. So it's right here. 100% solvent. So that's your B sub N plus 1. Next is the LN. Your LN is 3 weight percent acetic acid. So remember I said the LN should be right on the lower part of the face envelope and use the concentration of the solute. So it's 0 0.03. So it's a very small thing here. Here, one third. Somewhere here, a little bit short of one third. This is your LN. Okay? Now... I will use a different color for my line. So I will connect. I will connect B sub N plus 1 to LO. Okay. And remember that we solve for XAM, which is what's the value of the XAM you gave me? 0 0.06. How much is that? Mm, I will we'll look for the chat box. It's 0 0.06, 0 0.06 for the A. Okay, so if it's 0 0.06 for the A, for the M, very small. And we're here. Weight class. Is there something wrong with the values that we place there? Weight class. Why is it very small? Mm, it's because my, my, I will have a difficulty showing it to you because it's very small. It's like almost zero. Two hundred, six hundred, twenty-five weight percent, zero for this. XAM is very small. Can we go uh, to the suggestion of Emilio? We'll solve for C. Probably I will not have a hard time. We will not have a hard time determining the C. So we'll have a new sheet here. Let's find the C. It, our graph is very small. So you have LOXCO plus VN plus 1, YCN plus 1, being equal to m x c m okay we don't have a c in the feed because it's aqueous so it's zero with this one and this one is pure so whatever is our solvent uh, let me check our solvent is 600 so this is 600 times 1.0 is equal to 800 uh, x c m so this one your XCM is 600 over 800. This might be easier for me to plot. So your C is 0.75, right? So I can use the suggestion of Emilio. 
So we will use the C, that way it will not be difficult to plot against the 0 0.06. So it's 0.75. So if we go back to our graph, the one that I have drawn a while ago, lines. So my lines are gone. Hmm. Anyway, so I have here everything that I placed uh, start again. So I will have here 0.25. This is LO, this is B sub N plus one. That's LN. I will connect these two. Okay, then I will locate 0 0.75 here, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0.75 here for the C. And I will go to the right until I end on the blue line. This is where my M is. It's difficult using the A because it's 0 0.06. And what I do, I will connect. I will connect LN and M and extend. Difficult. So just for illustration purposes. So that's my LN and M and I will extend it here. Okay, like that. So it seems like here in what we have drawn that our extract, our V1 is right on the G that I have that the graph has. So in terms of composition, I can write here that you have Y C1 is more or less, this is for V1, Y C1 is more or less, if this is 0.9, so that's around 0.925. That based on what I have drawn. My A or R A in this case, we go down, it's like around distance here, 0 0.5, 0 0.6. So your Y A1 is more or less 0 0.6 or 0 0.65. The rest, of course, will be your B. Y B1 will be, of course, the sum of these two subtracted from one. So 0 0.98, 0 0.99. So this is 0 0.01. Now for the raffinate, for your LN, so we know already the X A N and that's given in the problem to be 0 0.03. Now the corresponding C for that is read here. So your X C N is more or less equal to uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.2, 0 0.05. 0 0.025, that's my approximation only, for the C, the rest will be your B. Your X, B, N will be, this is 0 0.055, 0 0.055. So you subtract everything from one. More or less 0.945 for the B. So in terms of the requirement in the problem as to the compositions of the two uh, layers, extract and raffinate layers, this will be your answer. So we need to take a picture of this. We need to take a picture of this. That way we can substitute it when we do material balance. So when we go back to our uh, solution, so if we want to know the actual value, so we have L or V1, Y, A1 plus L, N, X, A, N is equal to M, X, A, M. 
Now, this is already 800 times the value that we got a while ago, 0 0.0625. Okay, that would be our A. Here, V1, we will multiply to the 1A1 that we got, which is 0.65. Oh, is this 0 0.065, by the way, class, you're not correcting me because the A is 0 0.1 and it's not done beyond 0 0.1. So it's just 0 0.0625, not point, uh, or 0 0.065, not 0 0.6 because the 0 0.6 is even greater than 1, okay? So the one that we had a while ago should is lacking the zero before the six so point zero six five your ln here is your eight hundred minus b1 because the sum of these two would also be eight hundred then you use the xan that we got which is or that is stipulated in the problem which is point zero three now the value here of eight hundred 800 times 0 0.0625 is 50. So from in here, you'll be able to get V1. When you have V1, LN will follow. Okay, so that's it. You use the compositions that you were, be, that you were able to read from the graph and you go back to the material balance again. Do you have any questions or can you provide us with the answer here? What would be the answer for uh, B1? There are problems in extraction which we will be discussing next week, which is just substitution to the formula not as tedious as the kind of problem that is given in Janku, please. So in terms of the example problems, the sample problems of Janku, please, is, uh, shall I say, challenging this time than that of Makave because Makave's uh, problems are very short and the formulas are more straightforward. So, Katrina, your V1, this is the V1. The 742. Okay, thank you. 742.86. So you just subtract 742 from 800. So that would be 57.14. Okay, 57.14. The units given in the problems are kilogram per hour. So these are already the answers. The composition, so please edit the, uh, or take note of the correction for the concentration that I wrote on the YA1 in the graph a while ago. It should have a zero before the six for YA1. So 0 0.065, not 0 0.65 because it's less than 0 0.1. So 0 0.065, okay? So this is how the problem is to be solved. Any question? None? Okay, we will proceed with what's on the slide. Okay. okay so we're now on determining the number of stages analytically. Okay, not graphical. So what I discussed to you a while ago is graphical because you need the part of the process of finding the number of stages graphically and locating correctly the compositions of the extract and graphenate layers. Okay, so we will be now on the topic of finding the number of stages analytically, okay? Now, in your handbook, 
the ninth edition that is, I just checked on it a while ago. The equation that I have indicated here is on page 15, that's 20. Equation 15, that's three. In determining the number of stages without having to rely on any equilibrium data that is to be based on a diagram or on a table. You are though required to know that in this case, this was discussed at the beginning of the topic, the distribution coefficient, the K. Now, X in, X out, Y sub in, and uh, we don't have Y sub out here, are all defined in here. So it's all defined in here what this represents, all taken from your handbook. The K is the distribution factor, the F is the flow rate of the feed, and S is the solvent flow, flow rate. Now, why is this particular equation very different? Let's say, for example, you solve a problem on extraction and you use the Krimser equation in determining the number of stages graphically. Now, uh, analytically, if you recall in gas absorption class, we use also Krimser equation in determining the theoretical number of stages, both for gas absorption and stripping. In extraction, it's the same Krimser equation that we will use to determine the number of stages uh, analytically. The answer that you will be getting if you use Krimser equation and this one would be really very far from each other. They will not be equal. Now, why won't they be equal? I'd like you to read thoroughly on this part in your handbook, but this formula, it's, it's stated that, that this formula that will be used in determining the number of stages is only applicable to countercurrent multi-stage systems wherein the solvent that is being used in each of the stages to remove or to recover the solute are all fresh solvents. You may wonder how can it be? It's countercurrent, and the solvents are all fresh. So, meaning, the solvent as is as it passes to one particular stage recovers the solute already and is not being used on the next stage. The solvent that is being used on the next next stage is a different solvent, a fresh solvent, with a value equal to the value of the solvents that are being used in all of the stages. So meaning this formula, you see there S with the not. This formula is only applicable for countercurrent multi-stage multi extraction processes wherein fresh equal amounts of solvents are being used on each of the stages. Not like uh, what we have envisioned in the past, but what is happening is that as the solvent cascades from one stage to the other, it already carries a certain amount of solute. In this case here, no, no class, in this particular formula, the solvent, you are using fresh solvents in all of the stages. And once it already takes away a certain amount of solid, that's it. It's not being used in any part of the process already. So that's number one, fresh solvents for each stage. And number two, to take note, the solvents that are used in each of the stages are all equal. If any of these two conditions are not conformed, you cannot use this formula. And you will be expected to... And you are, of course, to expect that the answer you will be getting out of this formula will be very different than that of Krimser equation. Because Krimser equation's uh, formula for multi-stage extraction uh, uses a solvent in each of the stages that already carries with it a certain amount of solute. The solvent will only be fresh upon introduction in the first stage. When it is already being used in the next stages or on the successing stages, it already carries with it a certain A. So unlike this one, wherein the solvents are, are fresh. So in terms of uh, no, in terms of economy, this is actually, uh, if I may say, in terms of the use of the solvent, it will be expensive. But I think in terms of recovery, this will have a higher recovery because in each of the stages, fresh solvents are being used. Okay, this one is the formula available in your handbook. 
Kremser equation is this. The Kremser equation that is used for stripping in the topic uh, in HMP then, which is gas absorption and stripping is the same uh, Kremser equation that you will be using here for extraction. So this formula is actually the one that you had in stripping. You still have X and Y here, but this time, of course, X and Y is not mole fraction in the liquid and gas phases, but rather they are now uh, weight percentages, okay? Because we're talking about uh, extraction. This M is the slope of the equilibrium curve. The slope of the equilibrium curve corresponding to uh, or rather the slope of the equilibrium curve that has been processed and uh, converted to what we call as the geometric mean. Uh, shall I say not the geometric mean, but rather um, if you recall our discussion in gas absorption and stripping, the M that we use there is the slope of the, if you recall, is it the slope of the concentrated region or is it the slope of the less concentrated region or the, shall we say, the dilute region? This M is the slope of the curve. But what particular M are we using in stripping if we're talking about a curve? Because most of the time our data is not linear, it's curved. So we expect that we will have var varying slope for our X and Y data. So if you recall our discussion in stripping, what is this M here? Is this the slope of the dilute end or the slope of the, shall I say, the concentrated end? Who recall, who has, who can remember in stripping? It's the slope of the what? Slope of the, there's somebody on the chat box. Slope of the, sige. The M that you're going to use here is the slope of the dilute end. 